I'm Gigi. You're tuned in to the Green Gorilla Channel. It's the place where black men can express themselves freely, straight up with no chasers. But today I'm going to try to, you know, keep things clean as, a, as much as I possibly can. You know, every now and then I like to utilize pejorative ter uh, terminology or obscenities in order to express myself. But today I'll try to refrain from doing that. I might miss, you know, I might mess up and uh, do it anyway, but, you know, I'll try to refrain from that. I'm going to try to keep this, uh, you know, kind of professorial. But, uh, yeah, I, I was, uh, you know, scrolling through uh, YouTube yesterday and I saw the BGS and uh, Doc Johnson were having this conversation about critical race theory. And I caught it at the tail end of it. And, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> Mac McClinton said, yeah, right, keep it clean. Hey, man, I'm going to try to, bro. I'm going to try to. But uh, it's it's a struggle, man. Cause you know I get uh I get frustrated sometimes, man. And and when I do, when I see something that it's not quite right, you know, that that impulse, man, just comes out. But but at any rate, man, I heard them talking about critical race theory, and uh, man, it's it's like a hot topic right now because you got people on the right who don't want it being taught in schools and so now they're, you know, proposing that the curriculum ought to be taught, you know, throughout public schools in uh the US. And you know, there's a certain group of people who are pushing back against this. And I can understand to a certain extent why they're pushing back against it. Uh cuz you know, in this country, man, right now we haven't dealt with reparations. And, uh, you know, they, these people, man, really don't want to actually, you know, repair what, you know, they have, <laughs> what they have done, man. They don't want to pay for their iniquities, man. You know, uh, they, they're just operating with impunity. So, uh, but I just want to, you know, give you my spin on it, uh, and to let you know what I think about it, what I think it is. And, you know, I'll react as I go along. Uh, you know, I put together a PowerPoint presentation to try to detail and explain it. And so uh, I may as well just get right into it, man. So it ain't no big secret, man. Uh, it, it's not difficult to understand, but, you know, there's a lot to it. So let me just get right to that, man. And uh, here we go, man. So what actually is critical race theory, man? Okay. So, and you know, this is, this is, again, it'll be kind of professorial. It's not going to be, uh, you know, a lot of me just yipping and yapping. So I'll be reading from slides. It'll be a little bit boring, but not to me, but you know, it is what it is, man. I think it'll be informative though. So exactly what is this, man? Uh, it's basically a group of activists and academicians who are interested in studying and changing the relationship among race racism and power that's what it is so it's a group of activists man and scholars who've come together to study race racism and power in its essence i mean in its most general explanation that's what it is okay and it's an interdisciplinary uh, interdisciplinary uh area of inquiry okay and i mean so there's economics there there's history there there's philosophy within it. Uh, there's, you know, the study of egoism, both on an individual level and on a group level. There's psychology there dealing with, you know, people's unconscious practices and their habits versus their explicit actions and what they say up front. So there's a lot of uh, different disciplines mixed into critical race theory. But I also wanted to let you know that uh, critical race theory to me is an offshoot or kind of like a borrowing from critical theory itself, okay? And uh, if you want to know more about critical theory itself, uh, you could, you know, look up on, uh, you know, Google the Frankfurt School, because that's where critical theory was born, okay? Uh, the Frankfurt School is basically a school of social theory and critical philosophy that uh, basically sprung up at some place called the Institute for Social Research, at Goethe University, a Goethe University at, in Frankfurt, okay? It was basically founded in the Weimar Republic, you know, between World War I and II, okay? 
And that school was comprised of intellectuals, academics, and political dissidents and uh, activists. And they were dissatisfied with the socioeconomic systems of their day. They were dissatisfied with capitalist systems, fascist systems, and communist systems in the 30s. And so what they wanted to do was propose that social theory, as they then knew it, was inadequate for giving an account of political factionism and reactionary politics that was occurring at the turn of the 20th century or like almost near the midpoint midpoint of the 20th century. Okay. So they were critical of capitalism and of Marxism. Okay. Which they saw as ideological and uh, philosophically rigid. So what they wanted to do was to try to develop alternative ways of, you know, realizing the social development of societies and nations. That's, that's pretty much what the Frankfurt School was all about. So take what their mission was and what their objectives were and apply them to the subject matter of race in contemporary Western nation states. And, and then you get critical race theory. All right. So that's how that goes. OK. Now. I, I'll just have you know that. You know, critical race theory is different than civil rights uh, activism, okay? Critical race theory is, is, is something altogether different, okay? So in, in the civil rights movement, you had a group of activists, and they wanted to make slow changes to society, primarily through legal means, okay? And, and this is why critical race theory is a response to the civil rights movement, to be quite honest, okay? Uh, but... Instead of trying to make slow changes, you know, uh, incremental changes to society, they want to challenge the basic structure of society itself. Now, I told you already that, you know, when you talk about the basic structure of society, you're really using a Rawlsian term. Now, I don't know if you've heard of John Rawls before, but John Rawls was a philosopher, a social and political philosopher who wrote a book called The Theory of Justice. So if you haven't seen the video I've done on John Rawls, go dig through the archives and look at that video. And you get some more insight into what the basic structure of society is. But the basic structure of society uh, are comprised of the basic social, political and economic institutions that govern and regulate uh, the benefits and burdens of society itself. That's what it is. OK, so they're critical of liberalism. They're critical of, you know, the idea of egalitarianism, especially as it pretends to be either sex or colorblind. They're critical of the era of enlightenment and the idea that rationalism could actually, you know, begin to crack away at the injustices and the inefficiencies within the context of society. Right. And they also are critical of the idea that the legal system is impartial and objective. I mean, in, in their eyes, these theorists, uh, they're arguing that the legal system is anything but objective and impartial. OK, it just registers an opinion of the public at a particular slice in time. And, you know. Just because you get a decision at time T1 doesn't mean it's going to hold or be persistent throughout time. You know, things change. People's opinions change. The public's opinion changes. And so uh, what could be, you know, a concession for people of different racial uh, and ethnic backgrounds, you know, could be rolled back. They don't have to be permanent because, you know, legal decisions are not permanent. They're always in flux. All right. So that's one thing you got to be mindful of. Okay. And, and also be mindful of this. And I know a lot of you are not going to like this, but critical race theory is not, you know, heterogeneous. It's not monolithic. So you got Latinos, who have their own issues. They have immigration and language discrimination issues. You got Asian Americans and they talk about cultural imperialism and language discrimination issues. You got members of the LGBTQ community who are in this and, you know, they're critical of what they consider to be homophobia and gender prejudice. Middle Eastern people are critical race theorists and they deal with the subject matter of terrorism and Native Americans deal with the stealing of their land and sovereignty issues. So it's a lot going on with critical race theory. OK, it's a whole lot going on. All right. Now, 
I'm not going to show you this video. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to keep the showing of videos to a minimum here. Uh, but the origins of critical race theory um, was started in the early 70s. So, you know, as I listened to Dr. Johnson explain it, he's accurate for the most part. Um, Derek Bell was one of the founding fathers of critical race theory. I, and to be quite honest, I like Derek Bell a lot. Okay. Uh, you got Alan Freeman, Richard Delgado. Uh, there's a book that Richard Delgado and a person by the name of uh, Stephen or Gene uh, Stefanchek, I think is the name of it, uh, the name of the other author. So Richard Delgado and Gene Stefanchek, they wrote a book called Critical Race Theory. And it's like an introductory book. If you want to know more about it, it, you know, it's real simple to understand, easy to read, accessible. Check that book out. But anyway, according to them, you know, these scholars and activists and, and uh, you know, attorneys that uh, according to them, the, the civil rights movement basically stalled. And it's even begun to move backwards. And I agree with this. For various reasons, okay? Um, there are a whole host of reasons why, you know, the civil rights movement basically has come to a screeching halt. One of them, as far as I'm concerned, and I've said this before, is feminism. Although, you know, you have feminists who are involved in critical race theory, I, I don't think that gender studies has the same gravitas and the same weight as race. I just, I just don't see the two as being anywhere near each other and that's just my word okay like women because they were women were not whipped and put in chains and made to be slaves for you know forever <laughs> that that did not happen to them okay so this is why i take issue with some of the uh you know the the, the things that they put forth related to their own oppression and i'm not to say that you know women didn't suffer from disadvantages but you know I don't think that they had the same kind of disadvantages as, uh, you know, different racial groups in the United States of America. I, I just don't see it, especially because many of them were slave owners. That's just that's just my word on it. That's just my reaction to it. But. So what is it that actually, you know, buttresses and holds critical race theory up? So you got critical legal studies, you got radical feminism there's European or continental philosophy, and then you got black, uh, black and brown radical politics. Those are the, you know, uh, the kind of ideals that undergird critical race theory. Okay. So um, whether you like it or not, I'm just, I'm trying to, this is a descriptive uh, video here. I'm not trying to tell you what to believe or what to, you know, adopt on your own terms, I'm just trying to give you the information about what it is, because a lot of people don't seem to think uh, that is worthy of exploration or that it should be taught. Uh, uh, but they don't really actually know exactly what it is. And so, I mean, how could you be opposed to having something taught when you actually don't know what it is? So it's, it's just my goal to give you, a, you know, a cursory uh, level of knowledge so you can at least understand to some degree what it is. All right. Now, what's the significance of critical legal studies? Well, they want to put forth the idea, again, as, as I expressed it a little bit earlier, the idea of legal indeterminacy, right? Because when you get a legal decision from a legal case, there is no correct outcome. There is no outcome that had to happen. So, you know, like it could have went any way, right? So, yeah, uh, a case can be decided in a variety of different ways, right? And even when you get a precedent that is favorable to a minority group, that precedent can be dialed back over time. And this is what one could argue has happened with Brown versus Board of Education. Now, Brown versus Board was supposed to be a legal decision that, or a judicial decision that ultimately led to the integration of the public school system. But I mean, like, let's be honest, man, the public school system is not integrated at the current moment, man. It's, it's as segregated as it ever was. <laughs> so if, if the goal was to desegregate the school system, well, it, it didn't do its work. It didn't do its job. So you can have a de facto 
piece of legislation, something that actually exists and that is passed, and then you can have de facto practices that, you know, don't square up with what the decision was intended to, you know, accomplish in the end analysis. All right, so that's something you got to be aware of. All right. Then you got feminism, right? And it's significant to critical race theory uh, because what they do is they basically examine the relationship between power and what they call the construction of social roles, all right? And so what they want to do is explore the way that there are unseen and invisible patterns that make up patriarchy and other kinds of domination. So they, they're part of the mix, Okay. And that European philosophy is also a part of it. You got people like Antonio Gramsci, Michel Foucault, uh, Derrida, and they, you know, these critical race theorists borrow some of their philosophical ideas about domination and oppression, and they, you know, use them in order to, you know, make proclamations about race. Okay. And one of the uh, things that are paramount or one of the ideas that are paramount is Gramsci's idea of hegemony. OK, uh, and it's, you know, it's key to critical race theory, this, this idea of uh, hegemony. OK. Um, and I, I know I, I see the one brother says this schooling is evil. I don't necessarily see it as evil. It, anything can be used. Uh, OK, anything can be used as a disservice to black folks, but I, I don't necessarily see this as evil at all. Uh, do I think it's mistaken in certain elements or areas? Yes. Uh, but do I think it's evil? No, not by a long shot. What's evil is, you know, uh, little black boys and little black girls being spit on as they try to integrate a school or being told that they can't, you know, go to the same hotels as white folks. Or they can't drink from the same water fountains or getting, you know, sicked on by dogs or being watered down with, you know, fire hydrant hoses and stuff like that. That's evil to me. You know, uh, trying to develop a response to racism to me uh, is not evil, whether you're right or wrong about it. OK, that, that's to me what's evil. OK, uh, dealing with, you know, the fact that, you know, you got a black skin and. They don't want to let you in to certain segments of society and want to, you know, keep you pushed down. That to me is evil. But trying to reason about it in and of itself is not evil because who are you hurting? Who, who are you harming? Like, what are you taking out of somebody's mouth by, you know, trying to make an analysis of what went wrong in this culture related to race? I, I just don't see I don't see that, you know, no disrespect to the brother, but I just to Baruch, but I, I just don't see this as evil. I, personally, I just don't. But anyway, um, you know, I got this video. I I really don't want to show it because uh, if I do show it, uh, I think I might get shut down or flagged. So I, I think I'll refrain from showing it. But it's it's a video about uh, Antonio Gramsci and his idea of hegemony. And uh, there's another video directly after this one about Michel Foucault. And uh, basically, it's about how power is exercised through discourses and narratives and framing. And I talk about this quite often, you know, as I do my analysis of what's going on with black men in this culture and in this society as well. You know, there's a certain set of discourses and a certain set of framings in which black men are typecast as the boogeyman, as ontologically evil. I just don't perceive, uh, you know, black men as the boogeyman and as ontologically evil, although even black men have taken on, you know, these attitudes and these understandings, these frames and discourses from contemporary white culture and society and apply them to other black men without looking at all at the, you know, environmental and the sociological conditions that black men exist in. I think that's a shame, but, you know, hey, it is what it is. And we'll talk about it. I'll leave a, uh, you know, at some point, if you want to, you know, have a conversation about this, uh, you can leave a comment, uh, you know, or you can come by and, you know, speak your piece and get it off your chest. And, and, and look, I understand that there are, uh, you know, a lot of people who are concerned about white folks doing this. I, I have my own concerns about that. 
um, whether or not this should be actually taught in public school systems by, you know, white school teachers. And, uh, you know, I, I personally don't think it should be. That's just that's just my my opinion. Because I, I think, you know, you could be used for hustling. OK. Yeah, I, you know, and I do understand it could be hijacked by white liberals. I, I, and I, I do understand that. I don't think that they should be teaching this. Personally, I don't. Because, like, I mean, w w what is that going to gain? They're not going to be able to remake brains. A lot of this happens at the unconscious level. And a lot of these people, uh, you know, some of it is explicit, of course, but a lot of it is happening, uh, you know, at, at an unconscious or at a subconscious level. But let me show the video. Just let, let me show the video just so I could, you know, uh, let you see what hegemony is. And then I'll show you the other video so you can see what discourses are. If they shut it down, if they shut the feed down, just that, hold tight because, you know, it'll come back on after time. All right, it, it, it'll come back on, but check it out. Welcome to the Maquette Multimedia Series, a Maquette analysis of Antonio Gramsci's The Prison Notebooks. Do political states achieve dominance through cultural hegemony? Antonio Gramsci, an Italian Marxist thinker, believe that they do. Whilst in jail under Mussolini's fascist regime, Gramsci wrote The Prison Notebooks. In it, he explored the intersection between culture and power and set out his theory of cultural hegemony. Hegemony is the unquestioned rule of an idea, person, or entity. Cultural hegemony is when one ideology or way of interpreting reality dominates all others. Gramsci argued that the political state creates cultural hegemony to maintain its rule and to produce domination by consent. Consent is a crucial part of this system, and that is why language and culture feed into the power structure and control it. It uses an array of cultural institutions, from the press to works of literature, to create a public belief that its actions are morally correct. The state's domination is thereby enthusiastically consented to by its citizens. Any opposition is removed through social conformity. For Gramsci, culture and language are as important to political power as any gun. In his theory, norms serve the powerful and maintain structures of dominance. To examine how cultural hegemony works in society, let's picture a conventional American superhero movie. Our superhero is Mr. Freedom. By day, Mr. Freedom is a modern family man with a wife and two kids. But by night, he's out protecting his and other families against the evil forces of Soviet communism. Through this storyline, the movie has already transmitted the basic ideology of Western society. Capitalism protects your loved ones and way of life, while communism is inherently anti-family. Mr. Freedom's enemies are the stereotypical villains of the USA, while the superhero embodies the power of the individual to right wrongs and improve the world. The film goes beyond just showing the superhero beating the bad guys. It tells the audience that the bad guys are Soviets, and that Soviets are a threat to their well-being. The movie reinforces the supremacy of the American way in the minds of those who watch it. Having watched the movie, a cinema-goer leaves and walks past a group of people discussing Marxist theory. Because of what they've just seen, they immediately conclude that the group are communists and hence villains. The movie has reinforced the dominant set of norms in the society. Any challenge to this ideology is seen as dangerous. In The Prison Notebooks, Gramsci highlights the way in which culture and politics interlink and argues that hegemony is a cultural phenomenon. A way of seeing the world can become deeply entrenched in a society, justifying and reinforcing the rule of a political state. A more detailed examination of these ideas can be found in the Macat Analysis.
Okay, so there's that. So now you you know a little bit of what Antonio Gromsky is talking about. I mean, basically, he's asserting that there are cultural products that frame issues in a specific kind of way to make you feel like your natural acceptance of them is just innately good. And that people who have different ideas and different ways of thinking about social, political, and economic arrangements, they're inherently evil. And what they're doing or seeking to do is to destroy your good way of life. I mean, we see cultural hegemony everywhere. It's, it's all over the place. Right now, you can see it primarily in TV shows where you got this constant, you know, bombardment of uh, narratives which show men as inherently corrupt and oppressive and dominating. You see it all over, okay? And, and in particular, you know, I did a series of videos talking about how black men are portrayed in the media. And the portrayal is is hegemony. I, I think it is. And I think it's cultural imperialism. But that's just that's just my viewpoint. Okay. They they always show black men as step and fetch it, thugs, uh, or athletes, or some sort of entertainer or musician or something like that. Okay. And so either you get this idea of the mythical magical Negro, you know, or you get the idea of the uh, Negro at, or the black man as some sort of thug and criminal, right? But when you see movie after movie after movie after movie and TV show after TV show with these themes that are threaded throughout it, I mean, how else can you think about black men, especially if you're not in the contact with a large body of black men on a consistent basis? Then you, you begin to develop these ideas and these frameworks about what black men are what their interests are, what their behavior is like, without even actually knowing who these people are. So you automatically have some sort of innate response that's negative. Right? So so they 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 use this kind of language. And thanks, Jerome. I appreciate the uh, donation, sir. Appreciate that. So anyway, man, let's push on. So they use Antonio Gramsci, and they also use Michel Foucault. So here's the next video on Michel Foucault. And it's done by some uh, college-age girl. So let's check that out. This is Foucault. He coined the concept of post-structuralism to contrast the conventional concept of power and knowledge based on a dominant institutionalized sovereign system. His theory is based on the reproduction of regimes of power and knowledge and the creation of cultural norms. It is not a top-down system of power, but a system in which everyone participates and reproduces the knowledge through their everyday actions and perceptions. He says that a discourse or knowledge forms social realities which influence people's conduct. An individual governed by such realities then conducts him or herself in a manner consistent with that reality. This conduct is perceived and internalized by others, and becomes normalized and embedded in cultural norms which reproduces the new discourse of power and knowledge. So what does this really mean? Let's put it into context. Take for example the classic case of Bentham's Panopticon Penitentiary. The design of the tower doesn't allow the inmates to see whether or not there is a guard in the tower, while a guard could potentially be observing the inmates at all times. The inmates are punished if they misbehave in any way. It begins with the knowledge that there is a central watchtower, which gives the guards the ability to observe the inmates without their knowledge. This causes the inmates to assume that they are constantly being watched. Thus, the inmate will temper his actions as though he were being watched. This internalization of the threat of violence becomes embedded personally and extends throughout the prison. Through this exercise of control, power becomes realized as an institution. Yeah, so that was a very short, you know, description of what, you know, a discourse is and what Michel Foucault uh, would regard, uh, you know, a discourse as. It's a cultural product that reinforces a specific set of ideas and responses, which leads to, you know, a certain set of habits and practices and modes of conduct within the culture in which you live. And not only is this something that, you know, is enforced by a top down bureaucracy, but it's also something that's enforced by everyday people. And if you challenge the discourse, then you'll be met with skepticism 
and you'll be met with objections. Okay. So there's that. And then another element of uh, critical race theory is civil rights and black and brown nationalism, which, you know, the idea of redressing historical injustices, which is reparations. And also there's this idea of group empowerment, you know, black self-development, black self-determination. And you also get this with, you know, the Chicano and Chicana movements in the 60s, which was happening right alongside the civil rights movement. OK, um, these movements, you know, they were often entangled. And that's something you need to be aware of. And oftentimes we lose sight of that. Uh, but. I'll talk more about that later. OK, and dollar wheels, just hang on tight because I want to get through this uh, before I bring you up. OK, but I will bring you up. But just let me, you know, let me get through this. It'll take a little bit of more time, but, you know, I just I got to get through this. All right. And uh, there are spinoffs uh, to this. So, you know, critical race theory started off in law. It started off in the legal field uh, by law professors and academicians, but it has moved to other disciplines. So now it's in the educational disciplines. It's in the political scientist discipline. It's in women and gender studies, and it's also adopted by sociologists, people who do American studies and ethnic studies. So you, you see critical race theory everywhere. OK. Um, so there's that. But what are the basic things of critical race theory? Well, one theme is, is that racism is is ordinary, meaning that racism is everywhere, it's ubiquitous. And because it's everywhere, it's like, you know, you're a fish in water. You don't really notice the water. Or you're a human being, you're in air, you don't really, you know, acknowledge the air. It's everywhere, so it's normal to you. It's difficult to see, they say, and you can't actually remedy the problem by being colorblind. Okay, and a lot of people subscribe to colorblindness, and you hear them talk about this over and over again. Oh, I don't see color. Like, come on, man. Like, really? You mean you actually don't see other people's color? I notice it, you know, all day, every day. I notice that somebody's Asian or somebody's white or somebody's Latino. I can see it. But we can't get through these problems by just, you know, wishing them away and ignoring them and putting our heads in the sand or burying our heads in the sand. That's not going to solve the issues, you know, that, uh, that, that we have in this culture. All right. And then another one is, you know, white over color power, uh, paradigms are basically mental justifications for white domination and then you know you get the idea of interest convergence which we'll talk a little bit about you know as i get deeper into this but the idea is is that you got rich white people who basically gain material benefits but also you get poor white people who gain comfortability at having a better social status over most people you know who are colored or most people from other racial and ethnic groups. And so what this does is, is it makes it harder to change the system because mostly all white people are invested in the system in the way that it is. So even though not, you know, most white people are not absolutely rich, they still, you know, have a better social status than black folks. I mean, you can see this in the way policing is done in the way sentences are meted out in uh you know the justice system in the way punishment is meted out in the justice system in the wealth gap you you see this everywhere right so let me keep pushing forward and then also uh one of the themes is that race is socially constructed okay so the idea here is that race is not actually real and there's no ontological basis for it and an ontological is just like this fancy word for, you know, the study of being. But so what they're saying is, is race is not actually real, but it has real material consequences. So the way people think about race can create conditions in which the racial categories that have been constructed relegate some people to more difficult lives than other people. And that's what they want to draw out. And then another thing that they do is they talk about the issue of uh, differential racialization. And what that means is, is that different people from different racial groups get, you know, defined differently at different times. Okay, so 
the example I have here is like Muslims were not usually uh, thought of as terrorists prior to 9-11. I mean, yeah, not to say that they never were. I mean, I, th I think that they were, especially during the Carter administration. And uh, especially, you know, when, you know, they began to do, uh, you know, some violent acts themselves, you know, in order to retaliate for what they considered to be injustices directed towards them. But I mean, the average idea about a Muslim was that he was like a genie in a lamp or something, uh, you know, a magical carpet rider. And then also you got to understand that different racial groups or ethnic groups were not considered to be part of the white clan until after time elapsed. Like we're talking about people who are Irish or people who are Italian or, you know, even people who are Latinos who increasingly, you know, some of them are being characterized or defined as white, which hadn't been done before, but is being done now. So in other words, you know, like it's like the, the needle moves on what race actually is and who's in the in group and who's in the out group. It changes over time. So, that's another issue that, you know, is often discussed when it comes to critical race theory. OK. Um, another theme is this this intersectional theme. And, and you know, I've I've had my, uh, you know, complaints and my criticisms of intersectionality. I think what it does is it, it says it wants to anti essentialize people, you know, in their identities. But I think that, you know, if you're a male, it absolutely essentializes you and considers you to be a locus. Of, of violence and, and, and domination. And I just don't think that's fair to, to black men, especially because, you know, we've suffered some of the worst conditions and treatment of any group of people throughout the history of the world, especially in the Western world. Okay. So anyway, man, uh, another theme is this intersectional theme and anti-essentialist theme where no individual has just one, you know, identity. So you have a multiplicity of identities based on your race, class, your gender, your sex, whether or not you're healthy, how old you are, and what ethnic group you belong to. And another theme, and, and this is the last theme I'm going to discuss, uh, but it's standpoint theory. And standpoint theory is the idea that, at least for race, and, and you know, women and gender studies theorists use standpoint theory as well to talk about the ways in which either women or, or excuse me, either men or uh, white people don't know what women or what, you know, colored people know because they don't have to walk through their shoes. They don't have the same set of experiences. Right. Because they have different kind of positional or occupy different kind of positionalities in, in uh, the societies in which they live. So if I'm a white guy smoking a joint and the police pulls behind me, it's going to be a different kind of visceral response than if I'm a 17 year old black boy, you know, and I got a blunt in my ashtray. It's, it's just going to be a different kind of response and interaction between the police and myself. Okay. And a different kind of feeling, right. A different kind of experience. Like when I walk into a mall and, uh, you know, I see the police in the mall. I'm going to have a different kind of reaction than a group of young white girls who walk into the mall because the white girls are going to perceive the police as, you know, a force that is protecting them. Whereas, you know, black men, especially if they're younger, they're going to walk into the mall and perceive the police as a group of people who are fascist, to be quite honest, and who, you know, are looking to. To, to, to surveil and 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 to police you know their activities so there's a different set of norms and a different set of understandings and interpretations about the social world in which we you know we occupy so that's another thing all right now i'm gonna go into this uh, you know uh, in some depth but not a whole lot because i don't have a lot of time i don't want to be doing this all night i'm gonna uh, end up watching dr johnson's show later on tonight so i want to see what he has to say so i'm gonna try to keep this to a minimum but uh so you, you have the idea of interest convergence the idea of revisionist history uh and then you get this critique of liberal philosophy and then you get you know the explanation or the outline of something called structural determinism all right uh, and thank you again, Rasheed Barnes, for that donation. Appreciate that, sir. Appreciate that. So what, what exactly is interest convergence? Okay. Um, so basically, 
if you want to understand racial idealism, racial realism, and material determinism, uh, it's, it's important to the idea or the concept of interest convergence, right? And you'll see why as I explain it uh, as I go along. But you got some people in the academy who are racial idealists, okay? And for the most, peop uh, most part, uh, what they argue is that race is nothing more than a, a social construct. It, it isn't real at all, okay? And so what you have to do to remedy the, the issue of racism is uh, you got to change people's attitudes, you have to change their beliefs, and you have to change cultural images. And if you can do that, you can actually begin to solve the racial problems that, would, that exist within the context of Western you know, uh, societies. And that, that's the idea, right? So one of the adherents of racial idealism is Kwame Anthony Appiah, okay? So race is nothing more than a construct. And in order to change it, we have to change people's attitudes and their beliefs, right? But then you got some people who are racial realists. And these people say, look, racial categories and hierarchies aren't just beliefs and attitudes. Like you could be a white person and not harbor any animosity or resentment towards another person who's black or, or who's Native American or who's, you know, Latino at all. It, so you don't have to have animosity or venom towards a person, but you can still benefit from the social arrangement, which privileges you, right? And which gives you more benefits and alleviates your burdens than somebody else who is not white, okay? So it means the difference between you being able to get a job or you being able to get a loan or you being admitted into a certain educational program, right? So, it, it, you know, so the idea is that, yeah, okay, well, it's, it's not just an attitude. It's, it's a set of hierarchies, right, and categories and systems that keep a certain group of people back and that promote a certain group of people forward, okay? So, you know, that's, that's the idea, all right? And then you have a group of people called material determinants. OK, and for the most part, they, you know, use the concept or the idea of racial realism and they argue that nations basically employ or make up racial categories, basically just to justify the exploitation of certain populations of people. So. They just created whiteness. They're, they're, to be quite honest, they, they really actually did, because prior to uh, Bacon's rebellion in, uh, you know, the early part of the 17th century, there, there was no uh, white people. The white people didn't exist. They, they didn't refer to themselves as white. They were either Brits, Franks, Gauls, Goths, Ostrogoths. They were a whole different assort, consortium of, of tribes. They didn't perceive themselves as white. But I mean, especially in the United States, but then after, you know, Bacon's Rebellion, this idea of whiteness became entrenched in the culture and, and, and it's began to, you know, it's begun to, you know, stand on its own legs. All right. But anyway, what these materialists are trying to point out is that a conquering nation is basically going to demonize the people uh, whom they have conquered to make them feel better about actually exploiting them. So you get Mexicans who get called wetbacks, blacks get called the N word. Uh, and it's the same thing as creating an in group and an out group from scratch. All right. So uh, what, what ends up happening is like, say, for example, your blood. What do you call a crip? Call him a crab. Right. If you're a crip, what do you call a blood? You call him a slob. So the idea is to dehumanize a group of people to create an in group or an out group such that you can justify your exploitation of those persons or, or your commission of violence against those persons. Right. So that's one of the ideas, right. Uh, of material determinism. Right. So what is interest convergence and how do all those ideas connect and, and come together? Okay. So what is interesting about interest convergence is that while it's used in the service of demonizing 
and exploiting people of, uh, you know, in order to get material advantages over them. It can also at certain moments be used to explain the moments in which the exploited groups are given a small bit of relief or they're granted more rights. Okay. So uh, what Derek Bell, and this is like the genius of Derek Bell. I mean, Derek Bell says, look, the civil rights movement uh, was self-interest on the part of white folks. They didn't do that out of the goodness and the kindness of their own hearts. They didn't do that. Okay. They did it because they were engaged in a cold war. Right. And then, you know, you had the media that was for the most part displaying images of black people being sick by dogs or having dogs sicked on them and being watered down with, with fire hydrant hoses and being hit with billy clubs and being spit on. And all of this, you know, directly after World War II, where, I mean, you had the Holocaust for crying out loud, and black soldiers actually fought in World Wars, World Wars I and II. So how is it possible that you could be, you know, or, or juxtapose yourself as a benevolent nation when you got a lot of sickness going on in your own room or in your own backyard? So people throughout the world were like, man, you need to clean that up first before you start trying to proselytize to us and tell us to accept your social, political and economic systems. Right. Worldwide. You got to clean up your own room. Right. So that, so one can argue that's why you started to see the civil rights movement gain any kind of uh, credence within popular co United States culture at all. Right. That's that's his argument. OK. And another thing was that they were trying to stop the rise of communism, right? Uh, and to promote that, their idea of capitalism. It, it is also the case that a lot of these civil rights organizations were communist. And the Soviet Union was actually giving a lot of these groups money. Like, no cap. They were giving, like, civil rights organizations funding in order to keep up the dissidents within the confines of the United States. And so, you know, the United States was like, wait a minute, we, you know, they have counterintelligence programs and counterinsurgency programs already put into place. These people are meticulous and, you know, they dot their I's and they cross their T's. Okay, so they were like, okay, well, let's pump the brakes on this for a minute. Let's let up a little bit. And this is why you get, you know, like a person like Malcolm X who says, look, you could take the back, you could take the knife out of my back six inches, but that's not doing me much good. You still got six inches of the of a 12 inch knife in my back. If the knife is, you know, of course, 12 inches. Right. So that's one of the reasons why, uh, you know, a person like Malcolm X would say, you know, the civil rights movement, it, it was incomplete. It was always incomplete. So anyway, that's the idea of interest convergence, meaning that. White folks aren't really doing anything out of, kind, out of the kindness of their heart in order to actually allow black or any other ethnic group or racial group of persons into their society uh, as much as they're trying to engage in public relations when things look bad throughout the world. So they'll loosen up a little bit, but when everybody forgets and people are not paying attention, they'll tighten the reins again. Right. So that's the idea behind interest convergence. And I'll show you a, uh, a video of Derek Bell himself kind of explaining the idea and the concept uh, practically about Obama. So let's check him out. Well, I think, you, I think folk have heard from the master in terms of turning poetry into good common sense with regard to our, our, our people. Let me just talk about a, a, a few things. People say... When Barack Obama became president, that was the end of the old era. This, he said, would be the post-racial era. <laughs> now, it was important. There's no doubt, in, and I agree, uh, I, I agree with Hawkeye that I was one who felt not during my lifetime would it ever happen. Mm -hmm. It happened for the same reason the Emancipation Proclamation happened, that the Civil Rights uh, 
uh, post-reconstruction amendments to the Constitution happened. The same reason Brown v. Board happened. The same reason that affirmative action happened. It happened because white folk, usually small groups, the Supreme Court here or executive there, decided that what we were pushing for, fighting for, praying for, if we at least recognize it, the, the folk in charge, uh, uh, it would be a benefit to them and to the country. Without that benefit, none of those things would have happened. Brown v. Board is really an anti-communist mm. decision, not a equality uh, decision. And so the sinking is starting to get off on that video, and I don't want to show too much of it anyway. Uh, even though it is fair use, I'm using it uh, for the purposes of education, and I'm trying to explain uh, these ideas to a group of people. Uh, again, right now, I'm, you know, every now and then I'll come in with an evaluation about what I think. But for the most part, I'm just trying to describe to you what this critical race theory thing is. All right. Another element of uh, critical race theory is revisionist history. OK. Um, and. Revisionist theory, history is basically reexamining. America's historical record. It, it could be any nation for that matter, but it's like going back and re-examining the history of a nation and uh, replacing, you know, the, the comfortable narratives that the majority group puts forth and replacing those interpretations with that of the experiences of minority groups. Okay. So also what it does is it gives alternative evidence that sometimes, you know, held back in that record to support the new interpretations. Okay. And for realists, when you get attitudes about different racial groups, they typically follow what's happening materialistically and not the other way around. So you don't get a material change and then you get, you know, uh, well, you don't get an attitude first and then you get a material change. What you get is a material change and then the attitude. Okay. So, so in, in, in other words, the material advantage is what this is all about. This is not about justice. Uh, it's not about, you know, making sure that people, you know, are, are able to enjoy, uh, you know, coming in. This is about how can we maintain material advantage and what kind of, you know, intellectual warfare can we, you know, apply in order to make ourselves look good while we maintain that material advantage. And attitudes about different racial groups are based upon whether or not it serves the interest of the majority group and their material advantage. All right. That's what it's about for a realist, a racial realist. Now, an idealist is just going to say, well, it's primarily the attitudes and we can change the attitudes. But the racial realist is going to say, look, man, it ain't about the attitude. The attitude follows the money. The attitude follows the material conditions on the ground. Thank you, Gold Professor. I appreciate that contribution, sir. Appreciate that. All right. And, uh, you know, there's a, a, a good historian, man. His name is Howard Zinn. This is a video of Howard Zinn. I'm going to show only a little, a little bit of this video because uh, I know it can get flagged because I think the people who produced it uh, you know, have a lot of videos on YouTube and I think definitely it will get flagged, but I'm going to show a small slice of it and then push forward from it. Uh, but, but Howard Zinn, man, I, I like, you know, I like what he does. He's one of the most prominent revisionist historians, white dude, but you know, I like his work. So check him out. The well, basic problem of traditional history books is that they, um, they're nationalistic they, and, and they're elitist. By, by nationalistic, I mean that they, they look upon uh, the world as centered around us and they look upon American policy as benign. Uh, a more realistic and more truthful history would take a look at American foreign policy over oh, the last several hundred years, really. We'll take a look at American foreign policy and uh, see it for what it has been, expansionist, violent, militaristic. Uh, in other words, it would be a history that would be honest 
in a way that we expect individuals to be honest about themselves and their past and to rectify their mistakes. Uh, to do this is not to be unpatriotic or un-American unless you think, you know, that being American means uh, approving everything your government does or being patriotic means supporting everything your government does. No, I, being honest about our past, being honest about what we have done in the world. Uh, and a history that looks at what we have done from the standpoint of black people, Native Americans, poor people, women, people who have generally been omitted from traditional history. When you look at our history from the point of view of the people at the bottom rather than the people at the top, well, then everything looks different. Policies look different. Uh, you have different criteria for measuring what the country does. Again, I don't want to take too much time to show all of that video. I will, uh, if I can, post the links to these videos in the description. But, I mean, you can find them on YouTube. All you got to do is look up Howard Zinn, and you'll see a video on him. Michelle Foucault, there's like hundreds of videos, or at least dozens. Uh, Gramsci, the same. Uh, Derek Bell, the same. I mean, they're all they're plastered over YouTube. So all you, all you have to do is go look, uh, do a search, and you'll find it. Okay? So anyway, let's compare and contrast again these racial idealists with the materialist. So if the materialists are right, you have to change the circumstances in which minorities live before you'll get a change in racism, not the other way around. So it's not enough to change the attitudes. You have to change the physical objective conditions in which people live, and then you'll get a change, perhaps, maybe, in attitudes. So you have to deal or contend with the unions. You have to contend with immigration quotas. You have to contend with the prison industrial complex, the outsourcing of jobs. All of those things will have to change if you're going to get a change in racial relationships amongst whites, blacks, and a whole host of other racial or ethnic groups. Okay, But if the idealists are right, all you got to do is change the way people speak. You got to start speaking to trans persons with the right pronouns. You have to eliminate racist speech. You have to get rid of media, stereo, uh, excuse me, media stereotypes. You have to have diversity seminars and such. And these will bring about the changes. Now, one can argue that you need a little bit of both in order to bring about a significant change in racial relations. But if anything, you know, I would have to favor the materialist on this precisely because you know, um, people are not rational, man. <laughs> I don't care how rational people say they are. I think people use rationality to justify their sentiments. That's my viewpoint. Okay. Uh, I think that, you know, sentiments precedes rationalization. That's just my view. It's like being in an argument where you respond, not really even responding. You're just reacting. You have a, a visceral feeling about the way things should be, and you use your reason in order to justify that visceral reason or your conduct or the way you feel at that time. That's the, how I think people predominate. I'm not saying there is never a moment in which people are responding or they're being rational, but I think that, you know, for the most part, people are using reason as a tool to attain what they feel and not the other way around. That's just... I might be wrong about this, but this is just the way I see it. Okay. Now, maybe you could argue differently and, and make me believe differently. But, you know, I think, and, and there's a philosopher, or, or a Scottish philosopher, his name is David Hume. And this is what he puts forward. That's like one of the pretexts of his, of his philosophical system is that, you know, it, it's the sentiments that, that rules reason and not the other way around. For all, the, all of these people, you know, speaking about how rational they are, He's like, there's some underlying emotion that is the spring for the kind of reasoning that they're engaging in. So that, that's, that's just his opinion. I, I believe it. Okay. Another uh, issue that they uh, deal with is the issue of liberalism. And I've talked about liberalism on uh, some of my shows before. And, you know, this is kind of like academic is heady, it's cerebral. And, uh, you know, it just is what it is. But, uh, one could argue that uh, liberalism is a perverse way to address racial problems. 
right? So liberalism or classical liberalism is the, is basically undergirded by the idea of negative liberty and treating everybody, you know, as an individual. Okay, uh, that's not how you deal with this because uh, it, at least the, this is what the critical race theorists are doing because uh, freedom and equal treatment of all persons, you know, which is what you know these colorblind people prescribe ignores the fact that aggress aggressive race thinking is going to be necessary to rectify the racial oppression and domination that exists within the context of this society and many Western liberal capitalist societies. It's not enough to just say, I'm a person, he's a person too. Let's just observe people as persons. That's not going to solve the problem because that's not how the problem started. That's not how all this came about. This came about by looking at other groups of persons as color. <laughs> I mean, not colorblind. So how can you all of a sudden eliminate all of these issues by becoming colorblind and ushering in liberalism? If it was the case that you started off with the liberal idea from the beginning and everybody was given freedom and was treated equally, then, you know, we wouldn't be in the debacle that we're in. I, I, but I mean, you can't solve this problem by saying, well, oh, you know, I'm just going to treat you like a fair fairly. How can you do that right now? So one of the things that, you know, you have to look at is not, you know, uh, individual actions and, and treating people equally and, you know, giving everybody equal opportunity right now. But you have to rectify a whole host of injustices that have occurred before. And you have to use racialized reasoning to do that. And a lot of people don't want to do that. And they, we know why they don't want to do it, because to do it would be to accept responsibility for what's occurred in the past and to actually work towards rectifying it. Some people, man, one of the one of the things that most people just refuse to do is to admit they're wrong and to admit their part in wrongdoing and to rectify and to repair their wrongdoing. Some people just don't have the capacity to say, look, I screwed up, bro. I was wrong. How can I make it up? Let's 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 repair the situation. A lot of people, man, they'll they'll go to their grave without admitting that they did anything wrong. And it just seems like we're in one of those kind of countries where you got a group of people who are trying to cling and hang on to what little they have. And they 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 refuse to to share. In the benefits of the culture in which they live. That's just that's just the situation that we find ourselves in. All right. Uh, this is a woman talking about colorblindness. Uh, I'm not going to go through that. Have you She's kind of annoying, so I'm not going to do it. And lastly, um, is the issue of structural determinism. Uh, and this is basically the idea of our system by reason of its structure and vocabulary is ill-equipped to uh, redress certain kinds of wrong. So structural determinism is just like the, the structure, the basic structure itself of the society in which we live. It's just not going to permit for repairing racial injustices. OK, so. Uh, law reform, you're, you're going to have problems there. Uh, the empathic fallacy is the idea that, you know, um, We all we have to do is just, you know, begin to feel each other and then, you know, to, to, to have empathy for one another and things will change. No. Um, another thing is about countering hate speech with more speech. Uh, we need to have more dialogue. We need to be in, you know, more talks and discussions with people. Uh, it's like the Kevin Samuels approach, like, oh, oh, I can talk to women and get them to change their behavior. It's like, no, this I, I just don't believe that, man. People are behaving the way that they're behaving because the structures that underlie the culture permit for certain kinds of behavior. If you don't change the basic structures or the systems, you're not going to get a resultant change in people's behavior. I believe I believe this wholeheartedly when it comes to, to women all over the, this country and black women in particular. If you have a family court system that will award you child support 
and will give you alimony and you can get half of a man's resources if you, if you divorce him. Why not divorce him? Why be loyal and maintain fidelity? Why not be a single mother if you're going to get subsistence from the state? Why not? So you're, you're going to get the same kind of behavior. You can try to persuade these people ad nauseum. It's not going to lead to a resultant change because the, the system is not going to permit for the change. It's the structures, the policies, the institutions, the bureaucracies, which create the conditions. And that's, you know, that's what I've been trying to argue for for quite a bit of time. I think Dr. Johnson has been trying to argue in the same manner. Uh, there's a brother, man, uh, Mr. Palmer, talk about he talks about baby mama terrorists and stuff like that. You're going to have baby mama terrorists as long as you have a system, a bureaucracy in place that awards women money and by default perceives that the child is in the best interest when they're with their mother. It's in the, it's in the child's best interest to be with their mother. You're going to always get the same kind of behavior. You're not going to change anything. Okay. So this is what structural determinism is about, you know, uh, using a concrete example. All right. So, um, uh, chapter three of this book, uh, that I, you know, I've taught, I've taught critical race theory before, I guess you could tell, but anyway, uh, there's some people in critical race theory who, uh, you, they believe in using stories in order to, uh, you know, elucidate the realities of, of, of racial discrimination and domination. Uh, and Derek Bell is one of those persons who, uh, who does this. I, I think, uh, Dr. Johnson and BGS were having a conversation about cosmic slop. And so the idea is that you, you might not necessarily use syllogism in an argument in order to try to demonstrate the realities of race, but it might be more easy for you uh, to convince people by telling them a story or, you know, using a narrative in order to do so. Right. So uh, it opens a window, they say, to ignore it in alternative realities. Uh, there's the idea of counter storytelling. Uh, it could be a cure for silencing, uh, where you make people be quiet. Uh, they're arguing that, you know, storytelling has to be used in the court system or the legal system. And, uh, I don't know. I got my, you know, I, I think that there, there's pros and cons to this, but I mean, the idea is that you, you, you just don't use syllogistic reasoning in order to, to, to try to make a case. Uh, uh, for race and, and, and racial justice, right? Uh, so, so there's that. Um, I don't want to go through that because I, you know, I don't really uh, think that that's going to be uh, fruitful. But I mean, the idea of stories can help us flesh out the contours and the lines and dimensions of racial oppression, and can get people to understand what it's like. Okay. Uh, Next, you got the idea of intersectionality and essentialism and anti-essentialism. I mean, I've been going into this ad nauseum. I'm not going to explain what intersectionality is. I done done that on so many different occasions. Uh, but uh, what you get with ant essentialism and anti-essentialism is the idea that it takes a lot of people who are oppressed to make their voices heard and felt, but not everybody who is oppressed can be put into one category. And this is where you get the idea of intersectionality from. So essentialism basically says that uh, you have to ignore differences in order to advance larger and more fundamental political goals. But anti-essentialism says that there are intra-group differences amongst oppressed people, and it encourages those subgroups to bring their issues to light. Now, you know, one of the things that I don't like about, uh, you know, this anti-essentialism uh, practice, and you'll see why later, is that often it encourages in, inter, uh, excuse me, intra-group infighting over resources, right? And, uh, and it also ignores, by means of ideology and categories, uh, it, it ignores groups of persons who are really and truly suffering by marking them off and partitioning them off as a fundamental problem. And we see this with like black feminists and men, uh, black men all the time. So black men are like, look, 
we're the most killed by police, but as a black feminist, you want to argue about how black women are also killed by police, but black men are subjected to this kind of violence at 20 times the rate of black women. But black men shouldn't speak up because if we do, then we're engaged in essentialism, which to them is, you know, inherently unjust. It's like, wait a minute. There's, you know, like there's a case to be made that, look, this has to stop. This this competition has to has to end, especially if the competition is not really actually predicated on changing the basic structure of society itself, but really actually only predicated on a certain small subgroup of black folks or any other racial group being tokens. That's not going to move the needle for racial justice at all by a small subgroup of the black population, you know, being able to be written into the project or written into the, the equation that, or factored in. That's not going to work. Okay. So uh, there's that. And then we get to the subject matter of nationalism. Okay. Um, as it pertains to critical race theory, uh, should black folks and other oppressed groups create their own institutions? Just leave these people stuff alone. Right. Should that be the goal of what black people uh, are directed towards or should they work as hard and diligently as they can to try to assimilate to the dominant culture? Now, racial realists is going to say you're not going to be able to assimilate to the dominant culture. You can do all you want to try to assimilate, but there are certain features and functions of the system that you live in that are still going to carve you off and partition you away from the white social body, especially if you're a black male. You, you, you're you not going to be able to accomplish your goal. Now, this is what they're going to say, right? A realist or some variants of realists will say that. Um, but then you got the national. And I'm, well, let me just say this. Let me let me foreground what I'm about to say. Like black nationalism is for the most part dead contemporarily. I mean, you, you hear a lot of people talking about black nationalism, but especially in the university, it's a big no to nationalism. Uh, it's, it was rejected directly after the civil rights movement. You had the black power movement and, and uh, you know, uh, the, the black Panthers and all of this. They were nationalist organizations to a certain extent. OK. Uh, and one of the reasons that you get African-American studies is because you got black nationalist uh, activists and, you know, kids at these universities, man, who demanded that they have these programs. And now they've turned into racial idealist programs and, you know, intersectionalist, anti-essentialist programs. That's what they are now. So you, at first they started off as nationalistic programs and racial realist programs. Now they've kind of morphed into something different. All right. But, you know, that's that's just how it is, man. Uh, here's Malcolm X. My personal political philosophy, black nationalism, which means that the black man should control the politics of his own community and control the politicians who are in his own community. My personal economic philosophy is uh, also black nationalism, which means that the black man should have a hand in controlling the economy of the so-called Negro community. He should be developing the type of knowledge that will enable him to own and operate the businesses and thereby be able to create employment for his own people, for his own kind. And the uh, social philosophy also is black nationalism, which means that instead of the black man trying to force himself into the society of the white man, we should be trying to eliminate from our own society the ills and the, the defects and make ourselves uh, likable and sociable among our, among our own kind. Well, you seem to be dissatisfied with everything. Just what do you want? I'm not dissatisfied with everything. I'm, you, what you are able to see with your analytical mind is that everything that is offered doesn't produce what it's supposed to produce. And I'm just telling you that it doesn't produce what it produces, what it's supposed to produce. Well, what is your ultimate aim? The only way the problem can be solved. First, the white man and the black man have to be able to sit down at the same table. The white man has to feel free to speak his mind without hurting the feelings of that Negro. And the so-called Negro has to feel free to speak his mind without hurting the feelings of the white man. 
then they can bring the issues that are under the rug out on top of the table and take an intelligent approach to get the problem solved. That's the only way that they ever do it. We need an action program while we are Muslim, and while, while we are Christian, or while we are whatever we are. We still need an action program that will eliminate these evils that are in our community. And this is what we're trying to do with the Muslim Mosque Incorporated. Do you consider yourself militant? <laughs> I consider myself Malcolm. So there you go. You got Brother Malcolm, man, uh, advocating for black nationalism, okay? Uh, but here we come to the last part of this, man. Uh, I'm not going to, you know, uh, do too much more of this because uh, it's getting to the hour and 30-minute mark. But uh, there are some people in critical race theory who say that there is a disadvantage uh, in critical race theory to the extent to which it's only set forth in terms of a black and a white binary. Uh, then there's... Uh, the idea of critical white studies, and then there's other stuff going on as well. So let's talk about the black-white binary. So the question that this black-white binary or thinking about it uh, is supposed to uh, elucidate is that, you know, are blacks really the prototypical minority? And is their historical experience exceptional, right? So, I mean, the idea is, is this fair to other non-white groups? Are their racial grievances to be superseded by that of blacks? What about Asians, Native Americans, Latinos, people in the LGBTQ community? Don't their concerns also deserve attention, but are they diminished by the attention given to African Americans? And, uh, you know, I got my you know, thoughts and opinions about this. Uh, I think that black men... Uh, you know, have been pretty much left out. I think all of these other groups have used this black white binary argument to squeeze uh, black men out of the debate. That's just my opinion. And, uh, you know, when you look at the numbers and you see the empirical evidence, one could, you know, make the case that you got black men hemorrhaging, but everybody else wants to be written in. I'm like, well, have gay people been treated like black men have been treated in this country? Like, does the same experiences happen to uh, a Caitlyn Jenner that happens to an Amadou Diallo? Are they likely to have the same kind of experiences with law enforcement, with the attainment of wealth, with the procurement of a job, and so on and so forth? So it's a whole host of issues that need to be taken into consideration, you know, uh, when you start talking about the black-white binary. I, I just think, you know... Uh, Everybody else gets on the bus before we do. And by the time we are uh, about to get on the bus, everybody says, well, the bus is filled to capacity. No more room for you here. That's just how I feel. All right. I could be wrong, but that's just my assessment of the situation. OK. Um, but check this quote out. OK, so there's a quote in this book uh, that says, OK, few blacks will be yelled at and accused of being foreigners or of destroying the automotive industry. Few blacks will be told that if they don't like it here, they should go home. No, I don't agree with that. Few will be ridiculed on account of their unpronounceable last names or sing song accent. Well, that's because our last names were beat out of us. And, uh, you know, OK. Well, few will have a vigilante police officer, teacher or social worker demand to see their papers, passport or green card. That's true. Uh, few will be asked if they are terrorists. All depend on what kind of terrorists you're talking about. By the same token, few Asian people will be accused of being welfare leeches or having too many children out of wedlock. So, I mean, there's positives and negatives to this, but I mean, these are just ideas being espoused by some critical race theorists, right? I'm just here to give you the information. Uh, so at the end of the day, here's the deal, man. When you get one minority group, that seems to be gaining some sort of ground. Another group of uh, minority groups seems to be losing ground, right? This kind of, uh, you know, phenomena causes minority groups to try to get in as good as they can with white folks so as to be the favored minority. So ultimately what ends up happening is this black-white binary a lot of times it pits minorities against one another to play the oppression Olympics. 
And this is one of the main features and functions, I think, of the black manosphere. It's like, wait a minute. Don't use us as a scapegoat to try to get in and triangulate white supremacy. That's not the way to actually change the basic structure of the system here. And then, you know, the, but to add insult to injury, you know, you got black men being called the white people or black people and stuff like that, man. Like this, it's, it's gotten out of hand, man, as far as I'm concerned, right? And I like Malcolm's idea, though, like everybody needs to be able to sit at the table and air their grievances. But right now, what you got is borrowing from the idea of Gromsky and borrowing from the idea of Foucault, you got these hegemonic discourses which basically allow a certain group of people to get in good with the white folks and another group of people to be stigmatized by these by these same white folks that's not that's not the movement man that's not what this is supposed to be about but that's exactly what it's become and that's a shame and this is where we are and and, and i personally don't like it at all but it, this is where we are Thank you, Kiam uh, Kwali. Appreciate that. Appreciate the donation, bro. So anyway, man, it's like this black-white binary, man. Uh, you know, it's it's pitting. It's is what I call uh, you know uh, balkanization, or 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 fractional or factionalization. Okay, where you got different you know outgroups competing to become tokens for uh the the in group this is not a good this is not good this is not unity it's not like a lasting kind of progress it, it, it's just not that but that's just my opinion man this is my opinion okay and uh critical white studies man like i you know <sighs> man look this this is we already know, man, that the closer to whiteness you are, whether it's in comportment, behavior, attitude, language, education, you know, the better off you're supposed to be. But what's up with that, man? Why do I have to act like a white man, talk like a white man, dress like a white man, for all intents and purposes, be exact, you know, exactly like a white man or white culture in order to flourish and to thrive and to function on this planet? Who said that there was only one mode of being and that they figured out the correct mode of being so as to actually attain happiness and prosperity and to actually flourish and function and thrive in the world? Who, who said that they had it figured out? But again, you know, like I said earlier, who gets categorized as white fluctuates. And this is a throwback to that idea that I told you about earlier called racial different, uh, differentialization, right? But now you got white people who, because they see the advent of uh, this, this kind of theory becoming preeminent at the university, they're beginning to push back and say, look, you're starting to oppress us now. You're beginning to create discomfort and to discriminate against us now. So the question then is, are these kind of people accurate? Are they inaccurate? Are they being unjust? Are they being unfair? Or, or do they have a point? Like, okay, well, I didn't enslave your father or your father's father. So why are you, you know, like, making me feel guilt or trying to make me feel guilty about what I've attained and what I've been able to accumulate in this country. So these, I mean, you know, and then you got some people who are just outright hostile to, uh, you know, racial groups. And they say, hey, well, like you got black nationalism. We have white nationalism. Do for your damn self. Don't depend on us to help pull you up and don't expect for us to apologize. We're just doing what, you know, all animal species do. We're seeking to gain control and dominate the, uh, the, the political arena and the ge world geographical arena. And if you can't fucking compete, you know, you need to step on back and go back to the backwater country, you know, which your ancestors came from. What say you? 
So anyway, man, there's various criticisms. Some people say the storytelling is not an argument that can convince others to change social structures. So that's just silly. Uh, some people say you need merit, truth, and objective, uh, objectivity, which can't be thrown to the wayside in order to try to bring certain groups up. And then there's the matter of voice or tone. Okay, so let's go through those and then I'll be done with this. All right, let's start off with voice, tone, and respectability. Some people, you know, who are white on the right particularly, and this is why they're pushing, about, uh, pushing back against uh, critical race theory, they say that the critical race theorists and its representatives, they're too combative and confrontational. I mean, they got a lot of hand clapping energy and, you know, a lot of white guilting energy and it's just combative and it's, it's not conducive to actually gaining any kind of progress. Like if you come at me screaming and yelling, why should I listen to you? So, you know, like there's one, you know, thinker, his name is Randall Kennedy says like, you can't win over allies, white allies by being angry and being dismissive and trying to lay a guilt trip on them. Just you got to change your tone. Well, that's what they say. Okay. I'm just, I'm describing here, not evaluating on, at this point. All right. I'm not going to go through that. But first to a debate over. Then there's the subject matter of merit. So some of these people on the right say, look, y'all have had a long time to take advantage of opportunities that you've been afforded. And if you haven't been able to cat uh, capitalize on those opportunities, well, that says something about you, not us. So because you lack merit, you can't blame that on white society. You got to get your shit together. I mean, this, I'm just giving you the arguments. You can, you can take this and, and, and place it where you want, okay? Again, this, the storytelling element, like narratives are great, but they're not substitutes. This is like the difference between anecdote and making, uh, you know, a rigorous and a, uh, you know, a, a kind of, uh, you know, a strong argument. So the idea is, look, a storyline can be coercive and, and rhetoric can be, you know, abused in order to get people to conform to a specific way of thinking. Uh, and so it's dangerous to tell stories and it's dangerous to kind of, uh, to kind of engage in rhetoric to try to convince people of things. Uh, you need to be as impartial and as, and, and as objective as you possibly can when, when you try to explain things to people, especially around issues as sensitive as that of race. Okay. Uh, so those people who have stories don't fit into the narrative feel like they might be left out or they might be, might be marginalized. So, uh, you know, I got a series of videos that I would normally show if I was teaching a class like this. Uh, but I'm not going to show those, uh, videos at the end, but you kind of get the picture of what, where this is going now, man. That's for the most part, that's an introduction to what critical race theory is about. Uh, so I'm going to take a quick break right fast because I've been talking for the past hour and 30 minutes like I'm teaching a damn lecture. Uh, and so uh, I'm going to take a quick break, man, and then we can come back. I'm going to open up the floor if anybody has a comment they want to say something. If not, I'm bouncing out.